the top artificial intelligence scientists in the industry that works for Meta compared Elon Musk asking to call off all of the advanced AI development the next six months to the Catholic Church's resistance to the printing press in the Middle Ages. Jan LeCun mocked Elon Musk on Twitter, suggesting that limiting artificial intelligence is like preventing people from reading books. And he's referring to a letter that Elon and another co-founder of Apple named Steve Wozniak signed along with many other AI researchers, which is an open letter that talks about how an out-of-control AI could pose a significant risk to society. And we've all seen how the powerful chat GPT, which is powered by the GPT-4 large language model, is starting to look very human-like in some of the responses that it's giving. Now, some have suggested that you could enforce an AI memorandum if you look at international treaties and potentially even military action to enforce it. I mean, some just argue that creating a super smart AI under the conditions that we have in society right now is just a disaster waiting to happen. And the worst case disaster could be extinction. So add another item to the list of potential threats to humanity that we collectively deal with by sticking our heads in the sand. So Elon Musk asked for a six month ban, a break from all advanced artificial intelligence research like ChatGPT. So he says it's for safety reasons, but there's the other part of the story, which is that he was part of OpenAI. He severed that relationship because Tesla was working on their own technology. And at this point, they got leapfrogged. The technology that's at OpenAI that powers ChatGPT is just simply more advanced in some really important ways than what they have happening over at Tesla. So the story is that OpenAI started back in 2015 with funding from Elon Musk, and he was even the face of the organization. But a few years later in 2018, he ended up leaving after he clashed with the now CEO, Sam Altman. Now the story is that Musk wanted to take control from Altman because he needed the company to go faster. He thought they were falling too far behind Google's artificial intelligence research. But Sam Altman, along with the board as a whole, felt that Elon Musk was just stretched too thin and they didn't want him taking over the company because he had so many other responsibilities. At that point, it was boring SpaceX and Tesla and they just didn't think he had the time to give them the attention they needed. So after being denied the control, he decided to cut it. And when he left OpenAI, he also took with him a huge donation that was planned to be given to them. So I'm sure that didn't feel good knowing that they missed out on billions of dollars of investment. But I guess that's why Microsoft has now stepped in to give them all the funding they could ever ask for. But the split did have an impact on the industry, both on how it's segmented on the high levels, but also just the technology that's not shared with one another. So it is possible that Musk does have a lot of safety concerns, but also is a bit motivated by that idea that my company's behind and it would be great if the guy in first place slowed down a little bit. The Future Life Institute, which is actually partially funded by Elon Musk, is the one that wrote this letter asking for a six month break from advanced artificial intelligence research. So the letter goes on to say that we should only be developing this advanced AI technology when we're sure of what the benefits are and we know that we can handle the risks associated with it. Now Musk has been a big proponent of building a regulatory body to make sure that AI across the board is helping the public. You know, there's just not a lot of ways to guarantee that AI is going to serve the public good at the end of the day and that would be one element of it. So the letter saying, take a break until safety protocols are established. And it urges a collaboration between policymakers and developers. However, the letter is not extremely long. It doesn't have a detailed argument about how to make these safety protocols. I don't know how anybody's going to do this. So it is getting a lot of criticism for just being vague in general and being slightly hypocritical considering Tesla is pushing AI in every aspect of their vehicles. And don't forget, Musk himself is looking to build humanoid robots that are gonna run on advanced technology and they're gonna be potentially what he believes is maybe a big portion of our entire country's workforce. But the letter's not without additional support. Over a thousand people have signed it, including lots of AI researchers. And this has caught the attention of lawmakers. People are now thinking and talking about chat GPT and similar technology in our government, which is a great thing. Now, so far, lawmakers have shown a lot of interest in what risks it has to our national security, the little bit on how it might affect education, and how cyber criminals might be using the technology to target us. So John Stokes just wrote an opinion piece that I found interesting. He noticed that the people who really care about AI safety seem to fall into these three broad categories. Now, the first one he's calling language police. And these are the people who are really concerned about large language models like ChatGPT, LLMs for short, spreading misinformation and dis information and causing harm online. And because they're usually focused on social manipulation, they tend to be people who are concerned already with privacy issues, social network issues. Sometimes they come from academia, but a lot of times 
they're actually journalists or they aren't deeply involved in artificial intelligence personally. Now, the second group he's calling the Chernobylists. Now, this group is concerned about the potential consequences of taking machine learning models and then just connecting them to the real world. Things like valves and the electricity grid and manufacturing and stuff that actually impacts our lives. Now, machine learning models can make some amazing decisions. They can see patterns that humans could never see, but the fact that they can actually make a decision without any way for us to ask why they made the decision might lead us to something in the future where we just don't have explanations, we don't understand why it's happening, and it's just out of our control. Now, the third group is called the X-Riskers. So people in this category, which is actually me, believe that when artificial general intelligence enters the scene, we might just be like, toast. So us X-Riskers are worried about the emergence of something like this just getting out of control instantly and very quickly once it's connected to all the kinds of systems that it needs to do things that we can't imagine it doing yet. And we believe that AGI, artificial general intelligence, just pops onto the scene. We're not the dominant species on Earth. We don't have brains that can do anything close to what it can. A thousand times, a million times, a billion times smarter than a human and Maybe we accidentally get destroyed because we're in the way of its goals, or maybe it destroys us purposely, but it's just a very scary thing to have no control over something so intelligent and so powerful. So after 1,000 tech workers signed Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak's document saying we should take a six-month hiatus from working on advanced AI technology, UNESCO is urging governments to put their global ethical framework for artificial intelligence into action without delay. Now, this is an ethical framework that was agreed upon and signed off on by all 193 UNESCO member states. And it aims to protect people from the potential harm that could come from artificial intelligence. So the hope is that UNESCO's framework, this guide, will help benefits get the most out of artificial intelligence and also manage the risks. Now to their credit, the framework is fairly well thought out. It addresses all sorts of different things like discrimination, stereotypes, disinformation, privacy, data protection, and human and environmental rights. Now their argument is that we've seen the technology come far enough along now to know that the industry itself isn't going to self-regulate for the benefit of the citizens. And the framework also comes with many ways for them to try to enforce the rule of this law. Who should be accountable when there's harm and providing accountability to the companies that actually build it? And under this proposal, countries would be required to report their progress on artificial intelligence every four years. So Gary Marcus just outlined why we really don't even need to think about AGI at this point in history to worry about the kind of harm that can come from artificial intelligence, which in itself will be somewhat unreliable. It will be a black box that we don't know why it makes the decisions, and it's connected to maybe important systems systems that could break and cause harm. And he points out how troubling it is that a company like Adaptability AI, which just quickly raised $350 million off all this hype and wants to connect everything to a general intelligence, was just thrown together. It doesn't seem like it has that understanding that if we connect everything to a single AI, how much harm could be done. And he was citing how Europol released a report discussing the criminal misuse of artificial intelligence, including misinformation, fraud, and terrorism. Risk applies to both long-term superintelligence and short-term, like, mediocre intelligence. He boils the real issue down to control. This technology is powerful. Who can control it? The good guys? The bad guys? Everyone in between? If everyone has this technology, how do we feel safe and know that it's being used for the right reasons? So Les Wrong wanted to put a little bit of context about the thousands and thousands of quotes that I'm seeing from the godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton. In his recent CBS interview, he said that it's not inconceivable that AI will wipe out humanity, or at least that's what it sounds like he's saying every time they use it and repeat it in these stories. What do you think the chances are of AI just wiping out humanity. It's not inconceivable. And it does seem like that, and I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of risk there, but if you look at the paragraph that came right before that clip, they were actually talking about Putin using autonomous technology in the war. If Putin had an auto autonomous lethal weapons, he would use them right away. You just don't know what a system that's so much smarter than us will do. Do you share that concern? Okay. I think if we're sensible, we'll try and develop it so that it doesn't. But what worries me is the political system we're in, yeah. where it needs everybody to be sensible. So when you see this quote, just remember that it does seem like in full context, what he's talking about is bad actors having access to technology like this, not the technology itself turning into like an existential threat. Although that is actually still a real problem. I just don't think that's what Jeffrey Hinton meant. So I tend to believe that this kind of technology is growing exponentially. And it's one of those things where for a long time, it felt like nothing. The second it feels like it can do all 
all sorts of incredible things, then it doubles and doubles and doubles again until it's just so far beyond us, it's incredible. And we are probably at the cusp of that exponential growth curve. Anything that grows super linearly is crazy to actually experience. And I do think that it's impossible that we are gonna have an artificial general intelligence, something that can do basically everything a human can do cognitively, maybe even physically if it's in an embodied robot, using AI technology that's not that much more advanced than GPT-4. Even GPT-4 might be enough when you think about giving it enough iterative feedback. When it's contained in a chat system, it's just different than when it's contained to the real world actuators and robots, and it's verifying from multiple data sets, it's learning from the kind of data that it's never been trained on before, about our personal lives, about the way the world works, about human emotions. And then one day, like you won't even notice it, not like a big boom, but just a subtle, hey, here I am. It's going to be that smart. And definitely smart enough that if it doesn't want to be controlled by us, it doesn't have to be. Just like how we know how smart a baby will be once it grows up, it has that experience, it's had time to digest and learn, feel out the world, and develop its own sense of self.